is the Sunday of Orthodoxy, of course, so how fitting. Yep, this is, it is the Sunday of Orthodoxy, uh, and we're live. This is uh, Bishop Enoch. And this is Deacon Joseph Slayton, and uh, we are back for another show. Uh, this was actually supposed to be done last week, but due to circumstances, we just moved it to the next one. Um in any case, we've got an interesting topic for today, I think. Uh, it's something we've discussed in the past, but we've never really devoted a full episode to it, and a lot of people are asking questions. And by a lot of people, I mean people who are becoming more curious about what exactly uh, true orthodoxy, orthodox traditionalism really is, and where it's going. And so with that, we're uh, going to be discussing kind of the history of fighting from within and why it doesn't exactly work. Fighting works. Fighting from within, not exactly. Um, and we're going to go through, you know, the past, the present, and, you know, where we are today. So, um, Ludika, if you want to start, um, we'll get started. All right. So, um, let's um, give us an overview, Father Joseph, if you will, about what led up to sort of the modern anti humanist true orthodox uh, movement. Um, in the 1920s, what what happened? Okay, yeah. Uh, if we're just, uh, I'm gonna. This is an overview, so let's. I'm not. It's not gonna be conclusive. Uh, or you know, it's not gonna be like a really. It's it's a, it's a survey. Um, basically, when you have the formation of the True Orthodox Church in 1924, it was originally just parishes, and those parishes were basically served by monks from Athos uh, when the calendar change occurred in 1924. And this. State, uh, for lack of a better term, um, this was kind of the state it was until we get to uh, 1935 with the first declaration of the Church Church of Greece. Um, without getting too much into the whole Florinite Matthewite split, um, what happened was at this point, uh, now that the Orthodox Church of Greece had bishops. Um, people, more and more people were joining. Um, by 1950, as I've mentioned many times, there were already a million uh, uh, true Orthodox in Greece, which would have been 12.5% of the population. Uh, so basically, the first time you see kind of a glimpse of what would become uh, this uh, fighting from within uh, thinking, it's important to remember that Metropolitan Chrysostomus of Florida um, who was the public face of the Synod um, at the time, was continually approached uh, by people who were on the new calendar and weren't happy about it. Even bishops contacted him, uh, mentioning that they would like to go back. And at one point, I think it was like two or three bishops did. And then they went back to the state church. But the point is that um, what happened was uh, Metropolitan Chrysostomus was dealing ultimately with uh, the question of how to receive uh, people and how to treat them. Uh, if one thing that's very famously remembered is that uh, when the church formed and uh, you know organized in 1935, immediately the new calendar hierarchy declared that their baptisms and their marriages were invalid. Uh, because of this, the old calendars then responded in kind. Uh, and phenomenalism is mutually recognized most of the time. But the scenario in which Metropolitan Chrysostomus found himself later is a little bit more confusing because a few years had passed. Now suddenly people were much more interested in what he was, um, what he was doing. And so one of the things that uh, they did is uh, they, you know, Met Metropolitan Chrysostomus in particular uh, would, in his correspondence, uh, talk about um, potential versus actual physical. Uh, and this potential versus actual system is basically the root of where you get the fighting from within movement. Because what it ultimately does is it, it marks that unfortunate gray area between, um, you know, what is, if this person, did he fall away from orthodoxy because he was under a bishop for this long? Is that, you know, these sort of questions became front and center. Um, and so he was looking at it from that perspective. Unfortunately, that tramp kind of tramples over the basic concepts that schism and heresy separate you from the church. But being a bishop, he had his own responsibilities and his own difficulties with it. 
um, and how to deal with these people that were applying to come in and that were wanting to join. Um, and so ultimately, um, this led to the schism between the uh, Florence and the Matthewites because the Matthewites were like, they, they basically were saying he was theologically wrong and they weren't actually wrong on that, but one was speaking from the practice of economy and one was speaking from the practice of strictness. And so the point is that in a sense that kind of would lead to where we get to 1950 um, and then finally um, where they reaffirmed that there was no grace in the new calendar uh, mysteries to appease the Matthewites, which only partially worked. Uh, we get to 1962, when basically all the old calendarists in Greece are in agreement that the new calendarists are without grace. The new calendarists are all in agreement that the old calendarists are without grace. This question does not pop up again until we get to um, the uh, Callistite system uh, in 1974, I want to say. Uh, but in any case... 77. Claim, 77, okay. 70, so, 79, actually. 79. Okay. Well, that was the Callisticism, um, if you know about that, was a schism that took place under the leadership of Archbishop Oxentius and to some degree ending again with the Matthewites because it was one Matthewite bishop and one Florinite bishop who got together and made a whole new synod. Um, and from the synod comes Metropolitan Cyprian and the Synod of Resistance, who proposed. Uh, you should make, make you, know, you talk about Callistos of Corinth and Anthony yes. of Megara, I believe. Correct. But, I believe they were both previously have been Matthewites, and they in when uh, they had the correction ordination done for them at, at HTM by uh, Rocor, and then they then when the break between the Matthewites and Florinites happened again in seventy five, they they stayed with the Florinites actually. Okay, initially. all right, but and then they broke off and formed their own. Yes, synod. yeah, yeah. Just, and so this this was where we come into <clears throat> the thing with parallel hierarchies within uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, and this is ultimately where you start seeing the origin again of metropolitan Cyprian's ecclesiology, which if you may, which if you think about it in the 1970s actually makes a great deal of sense because you can even apply that to other true orthodox. It was just a very, very confusing time uh, with splits that were occurring um, throughout. But in any case, the point is metropolitan Cyprian was considered um, kind of influential uh, in this. And he, his writings kind of, they inspired people in um, in world orthodoxy uh, to try to uh, have to try to be ecclesiolo ecclesiologically stronger. Effectively, now, now, I, just to make a comment real quick, Father. Yeah. Um, remember, in the nineteen sixties, yeah, when you had the lifting of the anathemas, what's this like? Nineteen sixty five, nineteen sixty four. Nineteen sixty five. There were about seven or eight bishops uh, in the north of Greece that because that, the north of Greece was technically claiming to be under the ecumenical patriarchy. Okay, right. That's uh, new, that's, there, was, there were seven or eight new calendar bishops led by an Augustinus of Florina, who in fact sees commemoration of the ecumenical patriarch. Um, they didn't do much more than that, but they cease commemoration of him. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, Augustinus of Florina is an interesting figure for many different reasons. Um, for example, he would say things like, oh, Chrysostomus of Florina was a great bishop. I mean, it, but he's where he is, you know. Um, so you, you're right. There were people who respected uh, Metropolitan Chrysostomus, and they thought, well, you know, we wish we could. We could. It's almost like you remember the uh, there was a there was a um, like a letter or a by Archbishop. Um, Averki of Jordanville talking about um, the the um, the 1962 consecrations. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, he says mm -hmm. that he respected and agreed with um, Archbishop um, Leonti of Chile for what he did, but Archbishop Averki said, "I myself never would have had the courage to have done that." So I think there were people sort of like that. If you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, kind who, of who, who, exactly. They were afraid of being from the sidelines. And they were they were they were hoping this is going to succeed. They were willing to go a little far, but not. But they but they were. I, I, but I guess when they did what they did, it didn't really snowball. Yeah. Uh, and after they Augustinus of Florina like, retires, they just put someone in the in in, in um, Florina the new calendar diocese, and he just goes back to the ecumenical patriarchy. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's part of the problem. Uh, even when you have bishops, if if uh, 
or fighting from within, you start you start to see, you know, to what degree are they committed? Uh, to what degree are they are actually going to not be afraid of going further or even being terrified by people attacking them? Yeah, and so so, so ultimately, um, but the point is at this point, what Metropolitan and Kiprian had done was he had kind of uh, created sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, it was an ecclesiological statement of principles that um, would effectively say a person was, uh, as I'm sure people know this, this term, the healthy and ailing parts of the church. And this sort of concept was novel, but he was kind of basing it on Chrysostomus of Florina's economic considerations. And it was, he was, not, he was uh, also based, some of it was being based upon his own interpretations of session one of the seventh ecumenical council, which we're going to get to eventually. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and as I mentioned, this is just kind of an overview. We're talking about literally a, a 99 years of history here. So I'm going through it pretty quickly. We've made it to 1980 already. Um, the, but by and large, um, outside, by the way, we're only talking about the Greek. We're not, we're not even mentioning. I mean, there, there's a wider history that involves Romania, yeah, Russia, Rogue War, everything. All over this the place. A, um, this Bulgaria. Is a very, uh, uh, it's a very uni- yeah. This is a very specific. Uh, right. We're direction. using this as, a, and we're using this as, and there's a reason for that. That I'm, I'm bringing this up specifically the Greek situation. It's because the con- the writing of the ideas of Metropolitan and Cyprian, and ultimately those ideas being spread um, by people like Archbishop Chrysostomus of Etna, um, would eventually introduce a they introduce a novel concept and father Ser- oh. by the way father seraphim rose talked about metropolitan kiprinos uh in his writing his later writings he too. was very positively disposed towards yes. him if i remember they used to they used to celebrate together yes so um, see that's why that had an influence in real court and that, and what's funny is that people don't even realize that that happened that uh, father seraphim you know even for him considered being one of the moderates of real core was still communing with the greek old calendars no they, they never realized these things but um the point is that ultimately what happens there is that um after um uh, you know there's we get from you know the calisticism to we flip it over to the u.s and you have uh the 1985 uh letter of metropolitan vitali um, the Christmas of the Lord, yeah, 1986 the, Nativity Encyclical. Yes, but it was for night. Yeah, the calendar. Yeah. It was published okay. in the. It was published in December of 1986, though. I right. Oh, was it? I thought it was published it, it was, in December of 85. Um, you can look. I think it was published in New Calendar, December of 1986, in anticipation of Nativity, which would have been, you know, in a, in a few weeks. Where effectively he said kind of that the the anathema against ecumenism was applied locally. Which should not have been as big a deal as it was, um, because technically, bishops have to apply things locally. They they don't apply things universally. Um, but the point is that it was enough to lead to what was now known as the Hawkinsism, you know, in 1986 and um, And so this kind of gives you an idea of what kind of how people. Moved. There, there was a very large anti-ecumenical contingent in the now, group, which was part now, of Rope. Like, just one point, real quick. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a letter in 1975, wherein the Matthew Whites sent a letter to Rokor because remember, technically they're in communion at that point, right? All right, uh, and they asked what was the position of Rokor on the um, new calendar churches. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the reply given by the Royal Court Chancery, which the the office reply I think was given by uh, then Proto Presbyter George Grave, was that um, you know of course this is interesting that Father George would say it at the time was he saying this because it was the more or less def- the, the the only consensus position that he give as opposed to his own personal views which I think were actually strong more negative. He yeah. said Royal Court did not feel at the time. It had the right, absent an ecumenical council, to declare uh, the new calendar churches to be without grace. It's, they had made grave errors. They refrained from con celebration and they supported the old calendarists, but they didn't feel they could officially say something like that, like that they were without grace at the time. Uh, now that's interesting because it would obviously not. It, it's it's 
if you look at from the surviving writings of like St. Thilared and others, it's obvious he had a very, he did not have a, a view of um, like the ecumenical patriarch of being a church anymore. No, right? he had a, an extremely um, negative view. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and, and so my assumption is that when Father George wrote that, he had to take into account the fact that they had all these royal court bishops that had different, sometimes the same or sometimes different opinions. So what was the consensus view he could give? Right. Um, and I suspect that the reason the Matthew Whites wrote it was because of things like Anthony of Geneva, um, you know, people like that. And, um, you know, and, and of course, there may have been some, you know, I, I, there, there may have been some significant degree of miscommunication when the Matthew Whites even entered in communion with Rokor about what they actually thought Rokor believed on these issues. And there are right. some people who argue that HTM sort of, you know, intentionally presented only one side in the, in some sort of I don't almost like a scheme or something or whatever well I would the reason I think that that occurred if you want my uh, my view on that um, is that ultimately uh, father Pano Lehman didn't trust the uh, he didn't trust the Florinites frankly um, he had written uh, it was a, like a 30 page document uh, on the Greek old calendar bishops to um, a I don't know if it was to the Synod uh, generally or to Metropolitan Philaret, um, where it's like, I think it was called the Clarification, where he literally just goes off on all the existing old calendar bishops, uh, Greek bishops in the U.S., and talks about what frauds they are, etc. Because um, he has an incredibly low opinion of them at this time. And so uh, this is kind of why... Except he liked the Matthew Whites. He did like the Matthew Whites. And that's exactly the point. But ultimately, um, at the time, so he was, you know, I guess you could say kind of instrumental of, uh, in that kind of moving a lot of people in that direction. And so that's part of the reason why, uh, why that was. It, you know, remember, remember, there's also the, uh, the, the heavily doctored letter of Archbishop Seraphim of Chicago. That later, that later got exposed. Father Seraphim talks about that. That got exposed. And people don't really remember this anymore. There's a letter of Archbishop Seraphim of Chicago where uh -huh. it's supposedly a highly critical of Archbishop Exentius is addressed to him. Uh, well, yeah, I've seen that letter, but uh, yeah. I'm confused. Well, according to that Father Seraphim Rose, yeah, well, according to uh, Father Seraphim Rose and according to another document from Archbishop Seraphim later, the letter, he said, is, it's, it's, not at all what, it's not at all what he said. Someone mistranslated significant parts of it and added things to it. Um, Shame we don't have the Russian original. I mean, I suspect it was. It, it, I suspect it was. Uh, you know, something going on in Boston that was. You know, that's my not my suspicion. But anyway. Well, anyway, okay. It's not to veer too much off the topic, but the the whole point is that. Um, Whereas a lot of people in that true Orthodox, either or true Orthodox or heading in that direction, held to the the basic Orthodox ecclesiology of, you know, schism and heresy divide you out of the church. Um, there was this new kind of theology that uh, or ecclesiology that um, Metropolitan Cyprian had, I would even say, inadvertently created um, that caused a lot of people. Uh, especially in the official churches, to think, well, okay, I think I'm Orthodox, I'm healthy, and it's obvious my bishop is sick. Things like this. It's like people began to get weirder and weirder ideas, and this is ultimately where this fighting from the sin kind of movement really begins. Um, it begins with basically Metropolitan Cyprian's ideas, then filtering their way into world Orthodoxy. Um, and so this became even more and more apparent, especially as uh, the Rocor Union slowly, um, with the Moscow Patriarch, slowly started taking shape. At one point, it's, I wish I had that, but there was a letter, um, I believe it was, <clears throat> I believe it was uh, from uh, Archbishop Chrysostomus of Vetna, where basically uh, he's saying it's nice that you're talking to the Moscow Patriarch and all, but oh. Uh, we didn't actually mean union with them. Like that that's a bad idea and we don't agree with it. And it's not like it made a difference, but the point is that, you know, clearly so there had been a miscommunication in their ecclesiological ecclesiological views that 
unfortunately kind of was filtering its way not just through real court, but through it began to filter through world orthodoxy. Um, it basically became used as a way to justify communion with people who are obvious heretics. And so ultimately, that was where it you know, kind of began, is really the first, I guess you could say, concept uh, of fighting from within developed was in the lower echelon of many Rokor members who would eventually join World Orthodoxy and World Orthodox would agree with them. Um, it's unfortunate that they were not really taking into account what was actually happening. Uh, like, for example, like the anathema against ecumenism that's constantly referenced now in the fighting from within movement. People forget that Bishop Gabriel did an interview, which I'm pretty sure is still on YouTube, where he basically said, well, when we join a union, the anathema means nothing anymore. Um, so this kind of thinking, it, it never, it, 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 up until this moment, it had at least some kind of hierarchical sanction. But after that, the hierarchical sanction starts to disappear. But before we get to that, there was another major factor which we got to talk about, which occurred before the 2000 document of the MP, which led to the 2007 reunion, and that is the 1997 departure of the Georgian Church from the World Council of Churches. It was 1999. What? It was wasn't 1999, 1999, wasn't it? I thought it was 1997. Let me, let me just double check. No, it's 1999. Well, okay. It so might be 2001, actually, but 1999. No, I guess it definitely was before uh, 2000. It's 1999. Okay, I'm checking. Hold on. Not that it's a big, it's not a big deal. The point is, um, hold on. Anyway, the point is that ultimately, um, ultimately, Georgia's departure from the World Council of Churches was, in fact, a response to um, was, in fact, a response to a growing uh, movement of monks and clergy who basically. Uh, were starting to organize another counter church, basically a church that was church of Georgia, which had sanctioned. Um, no, you're and, right. It's 1997. Okay. Um, as I said, it's not relevant. But the point is that um, ultimately, Hakna was sponsoring this. So these clergy were going to basically create a parallel hierarchy in Georgia, and Patrick Olia saw that so many people were behind it. At one point, it was literally dozens upon dozens of monks and clergy. Uh, that he knew that he'd be dealing with a very big problem. He thought, what's the easiest and quickest solution? Even though he had, he had been a committed ecumenist, in 1997, he said, that's it, we have to pull out of the World Council of Churches. I don't want a division of the church. That's exactly what they did. And uh, it actually turned out positive for them. It actually worked out well in terms of the church getting back credibility and respect, whereas a lot of other churches were not. That said... Um, one of the things that we I want to talk about, and we probably should do this after we talk about the Seventh Council, is um, the fact that uh, the fact that the reason why it's difficult to work in a fighting from within environment is because of the fact that there is an enmeshed um, there's an enmeshed hierarchical structure that will not allow it, um, and I, we'll go more into that in a little bit. But ultimately. So really, once you get to 1997, you see this whole, uh, this whole, uh, I guess you could say, kind of pulling out of the World Council of Churches. I don't know how practical it was in terms of um, actual change, but it did make enough of a difference that the uh, in Georgia uh, there was no real. Um, it's a very, it's a relatively small group of true Orthodox in Georgia. Um, and so that has worked out in their favor. So this is why every time people actually walk away from doing ecumenical stuff, um, it actually works out well for them. And uh, let me see here. Okay, I didn't see this. What, what is this? This is, uh, hold on. This is, let's see here. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, there was, there was uh, stuff written by um there was stuff written in the uh synod of resistances uh documents that uh bishop enoch was showing did you want me to share this uh you mean the church of georgia and the wcc article yeah mm -hmm. sure okay one moment
Okay. And so we've got that up. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to read it? or You can. Uh, okay. Um, give me a second. So this was basically, this was uh, in written in um, the uh, Agios Kiprianos, which is uh, the Greek kind of version. Uh, it was the official publication of the uh, TOC of Greece under Metropolitan Cyprian. What he says is the April to June 1997 issue of Orthodoxos Enemerosis, the Orthodox Informer, a tri-monthly per periodical published in Athens, Greece, by our Synod of Bishops, was devoted entirely to the withdrawal on May 20th, 1997, new style, of the Autocephalous Church of Georgia from the World Council of Churches and subsequently from another ecumenical body, the Council of European Churches. This move was prompted by a popular uprising among clergymen from some of Georgia's more ancient and revered monastic communities, who, in a now well-known and widely distributed open letter to Catholicos Patriarch Galia, but dated April 14, 1997, old style, flatly condemned their church's participation in the ecumenical movement, which movement they characterized not only as a heresy, but moreover as the heresy of heresies, demanding that the Georgian hierarchy withdraw immediately from the WCC and all other ecumenical organizations. The editors of the Orthodox Informer, while expressing satisfaction and joy with thanksgiving to the divine founder of the church, at being informed of the highly interesting, de interesting developments in the Church of Georgia, while noting their great pleasure with any resistance against the pan heresy of ecumenism by whomever and by whatever means itself, nonetheless, albeit optimistically, advised caution about these events. And uh, he basically goes on to say that the main reason that uh, Patriarch Leah did this was simply to avoid a schism and that he condemned the uh, protesting monastics and clergy uh, as, as schismatics. Um, so um, this is kind of the kind of the backdrop to it. Um, now, granted, this was in 1997. Fast forward 26 years, and um, where we are today, and Patriarch Lee is still relatively against ecumenism. You mentioned mm, something. I mean, he did he did do that meeting and that uh, joint meeting with Pope Francis when Francis visited Georgia. Yeah, and so, so this I mean, is, that's don't, not we don't want to go. I, 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 is it really he's against ecumenism in principle? Or he's, or he's afraid of what's going to happen, so he's got to be very cautious about things. I think that it's, yeah, it's always... Hope, so, I mean, in, in, yeah, in, I mean, it's, it's always have a concert and light candles together, so th there are still significant problems going on there to be. Yeah. Case. And so, basically, one of the things that... Uh, that's One of the things to keep in mind is that you would think that after 26 years, by now, there'd be an entire generation of anti-ecumenists, etc., uh, people who are ready to take on the mantle, but that's not what you find. What you find is that in the seminaries, uh, they're still teaching Western liberal uh, ideas um, and ecumenical and modernist ideas. And effectively, most of the people who are in who are in these seminaries, from the um, from the uh, hierarchy to the students, are simply waiting for patriarchalia to die. So it's not a realistic assessment to say that they're really uh, fighting ecumenism, you know, from within, because really the only one who's said anything about it and half-heartedly is Patrick Galea and pulled out of the WCC and the CEC. But um, unfortunately, that is not really enough. Um, hold on. Um, give me a second. That is not really enough to... Um, to keep, stop, uh, stave off the rising tide of heresy. Ultimately, you have to, have a plan. You have to actually have a, a feasible plan to begin with. Right. And, and if so, you don't have the hierarchy on your side, you don't have a feasible plan of, of taking over a local church. Exactly. And so this is kind of where um, a lot of this is kind of where a lot of people uh, became very um, kind of big on. Uh, the fighting from within concept around the 1997 1998 period because uh, it was also around the time that you know some contacts between the core and the mpn uh started really heating up um and so ultimately fighting from within looked like, like a really good idea because shoot if the patriarch of georgia is doing it everyone's going to join that's not what happened um and so ultimately this is kind of where the proper Fighting from within movement really begins. Um, 
I would say that probably one of its, as I've mentioned before, unfortunately, one of its notable, one of the notable people pushing it was formerly part of the Blonson, and that would be uh, Archbishop Lazar Pahala. Um, and so his kind of guidance to people was ultimately a sort of fighting from within, and he ended up retiring in the OCA. Um, but past that, it's really not really, uh, I guess you could say, a largely noteworthy movement. There was a reader uh, who was very well known in the U.S., but he became a liberal um, almost immediately after he left. Uh, past that, ultimately, fighting from within was kind of a kind of a grassroots movement, but it never had much uh, higher. It had no hierarchical support and very little priestly support. Uh, so when we enter into the age of, you know, kind of YouTube and, you know, social media, um, you know, we find Father Peter Hears' work is probably the best known fighting from within work, and he does fantastic work in terms of his texts and stuff like that. But if you're wondering, in, in a normal world, Father Peter would probably be welcome at any church he went to, but that we don't live in a normal world. We live in this one. And in this one, ultimately, he has to, you know, kind of sneak his way into the real core, and that's where we are. Um, I don't know, do you have uh, thoughts on this, uh, Uh No, no, I mean, I just, uh, no, I mean, you're, this is the problem with the funding from with, they have simply no support, hierarchical support. At least, the hierarchical support they have is, is extremely tepid and cautious. They might, in, in Greece, they might be able to point to, um, what's his name, um, Sarah from a Piraeus. Yeah, but even Sarah he was Piraeus a lot. Like, no one trusts him because of the COVID thing. Yeah, he and he basically excommunicated people who refused to take the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, he has strange uh, views where he basically denied that Our Lady was bought, after her death was was resurrected and bodily assumed in the heaven. He's just like, well, who knows where the Theotokos body is? And he's just he made some statement where he said he doesn't believe in transubstantiation. I mean, it's just this, really? some of these people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's some of these people are very. Uh, to say the least, um, heretical in other in other in other ways. Well, and there was the other case of that one Moscow Patriarch and Bishop who, uh, you know, he uh, the image, the well, he turned out to be a Muslimist. No, well, he became an Muslimist anyway. Well, he became right? a so, uh, Yeah, okay. that started like a year happened. later. Yeah, so in any case, that was you know another example. So really, the few examples you can find of bishops who could. Support it usually have their own problems and ultimately I mean, the one closest would have been the moscow patriot bishop in southern ukraine um uh, Lo uh longan uh, long yeah i can't remember the diet the sea he was uh he was bishop of it was actually a newly created sea that they just they stuck him in because no one wanted it and that's sort of how these these people in world orthodoxy get by that they're like some obscure you know hiram monk who they're like, oh, well, let's just put this, let's make Hiram Monk so-and-so bishop of this, like, newly created place that nobody right. wants. And he, he becomes successful because nobody wants it. He, you know, he's actually a sincere person. He built, like, a lot of orphanages. He, he was, you know, I think he actually is, like, half Romanian, uh, Moldovan yeah. or whatever. Uh, and uh, what happened with him is he, uh, he was pretty serious, and he said, like, this whole communism thing is, is, is evil. And then he, with a lot of other, I think, I think what happens is in places like Russia, whatever is left of Ukraine, um, if if there are sort of like anti-cumanist uh, clergy, and they kind of talk to different bishops, and they find somebody like a bishop Longan, uh, who is like sympathetic, genuinely sympathetic, they're they're a crowd around him. If you know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And what happens is eventually they feel they're like it's self-reinforcing you know that oh we're we're in a stronger position now okay and you know if, if it's not just you by yourself out in the middle of nowhere you don't you know you you feel you don't you don't uh you don't think you're by yourself and so i think at one point he said he ceases commemoration of the patriarch right. i don't know if he ever sees commemoration of um uh the mp guy in kiev uh which is technically not the mp now whatever it's supposed to be um, he may have them, not quite sure. And they never moved to depose him because I think they were kind of scared of him. All right. Yeah. Because remember, generally, when people uh, resist, like the, the Fanar or the MP over ecumenism, 
they will be attacked in every single possible way. Like their lives, they, they will try to accuse you of just terrible things in your personal life. But the problem with Longan was that they couldn't really find anything. It was just, it was just something. It was, he was too clean. Exactly. There was just nothing he said. It was, and the fact is, what you got some guy who's like he literally had like a hundred adopted children. Yeah. Orphanages. Uh, are they going to? I mean, if they had attacked him politically, it would have been absolute suicide. So they simply, in that case, they left him alone. Something happened, I don't know how or when, where they eventually, I guess, reconciled. Yeah. I don't know if he, I, I, I think he agreed. I don't know if he ever agreed. Well, at this point, none of none of the U.S., most of the U.S. U.S.C. MP bishops aren't commemorating Carroll anyway. Right. Um, so I don't know what they're, I mean, that's beside the point, but. That was sort of disappointing to actually to a lot of the fighting from within people because uh, they had actually they felt that they were going to like like long in and maybe had a few other people that were going to like start a, like a almost like a synod in resistance in the Moscow Patriarchate for lack of better yeah. words. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it for whatever reason it didn't turn out like that. Uh, probably I, I would have the guess long and probably realized he had nobody to support him. Yeah, and this um, is this is one of the things. Was, he, was, he, he was a fluke in that situation, and they just pressured him to the point where he gave up. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind is that whenever you see resistance movements like this, the unfortunate part is that ultimately, and I hate to use this term uh, from gambling, but the house always wins. If your entire hierarchy is stacked, and its administrative apparatus underneath that perpetuates that hierarchy is stacked with humanists, you're going to keep producing a human. You might make a mistake occasionally, and you might end up with a real possible threat, like the bishop, this Bishop Longin, but then eventually it peters out because, frankly, there aren't enough people. There's No one's going to turn on his side. The few people who might have been on his side are too scared to do anything. And once you realize that, you're stuck. Um, and so this is kind of where... Things, uh, this is where the, that's part of the reason why fighting from within does just practically it's a great concept in principle, and I really respect a lot of the people who are involved in it. But the reality is, it's, it's a losing game. You, you don't well, there's win. also an histor there's an historical uh point to learn here, okay? Okay, uh, as, as you've noted, I mean, I've said the same thing if your entire hierarchy is at absolute best, very you know, that tepid or hot or tepidly hostile to you on this question. You're not going anywhere. You can point to, let's say, like the case of St. Meletius of Antioch and others. And I've talked, we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. But what's sort of the difference? Well, if you had a situation where there were dozens of bishops who may have been t maybe a little terrified, but they're, you know, if someone gives enough push, they're willing to, to turn on the heretics in charge, all right? You could effectively fight from within because you're going to take over, all right? Uh, and that's sort of what happened with St. Meletius. You know, there's the famous uh, um, St. Meletius was originally, um, before he was St. Meletius, was made Bishop of Sebastia, in Asia, I think in Asia Minor or Greater Armenia or something, uh, mm -hmm. by Arians. I mean, that's that's made clear in the uh, Sozomen and Socrates, the ecclesiastical historian, St. Theodore says the same thing. And then eventually um, he is... Achacius of Caesarea, who was basically called the tongue of the Arians in the East, uh, has him translated to Antioch. All right. And it's there in Antioch that at one point he is, sort of ascends the Ambon after he's elected, sometime after he's elected, and he proclaims publicly the uh, that the son is consubstantial to the father. The father right. Yes. And at that point, um, you know, he becomes the leader of a large portion of the Orthodox laity. And he has a lot of bishops in the East who at that point are like, well, the patriarch is the patriarch of Antioch. Now there was another guy, St. Paulinus, who was also claiming to be the patriarch of Antioch, who was Orthodox. I mean, that's another complicated story, but it took a figure like Meletius to sort of, you know, because remember, why did it work with him? I think because, uh, you know, he was in a position like as, a, as actually a primate of, a, of an apostolic see, all right? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people may have also, you know, uh, they respected his, his his personal life, his sanctity. He was now proclaiming the Orthodox teaching. Uh, he had a lot of supporters. 
So that's a successful. I mean, you might say that's like a legitimate fighting from with that actually works. Well, that's just um, straight up fighting. Yes, that's yeah, exactly. They just took over, and of course, Akaki <laughs> says Maria didn't like this, so he did like a pseudo deposition of him, which no one recognized, of course. Yeah. Uh, and you know, and it led to them having to create another, like an Arian bishop of Antioch. I mean, maybe there had been an Arian before Miletius, but they had to create like another guy. And I think they translated the, the, that guy eventually got translated to like to, to Constantinople or something like that, since the Arians moved everybody around so much. All right. Uh, and uh, you know, and even it got to the point that after Julian the Apostate died, and what when did Julian the Apostate like three sixty five or three sixty four or something like that? Yeah. The next. The, okay, the next Eastern Emperor was a man was a, a general called Jovian, and Jovian was Orthodox. I mean, he had some personal problems. Um, you know, he had, you know, had personal issues and such. But he was per, he was an Orthodox emperor. Uh, and what you find is, because there were people like Saint Meletius and others who had sort of they didn't care. If, you know, they got to the point where. Uh, they didn't care if Acacius and the, all the leaders of the official church look, claimed they deposed them, whatever. They had enough support, and they were willing to go through enough. That Acacius of Caesarea, contrary to all expectations, when Jovian becomes emperor, Acacius of Caesarea proclaims what? Well, Acacius says, well, I'm now orthodox. Uh, well, I mean, he didn't say orthodox. He says he now believes in the homoousion. All right? Yeah, right. So, it was purely for political reasons, but he, he ends up consecrating a number of bishops like Pelagius of Laodicea, not to be confused with the heresy arch Pelagius later, who's actually a, a, a Pelagius of Laodicea, but later becomes a bishop, in the, uh, a saint in the Orthodox Church, uh, and uh, several other figures. And after Jovian dies, Acacius sort of goes back. So you can see Acacius at that point saw when Jovian was alive that that, that so many people had, had made the jump to stand up against him, especially bishops, all right? That he sort of went with the political winds, which was orthodoxy. Okay, when Jovian dies, the new emperor comes in. I think the new emperor is like an Arian or something like that. You know, semi crypto Arian or whatever. Acacius then reverts back to Arians. All right, straight up Arianism. All right, but in the meantime, he had been pushed. You know, the, he had been pushed around so much that he had to create a number of orthodox bishops who did not go along with Arianism when he returned to it. All right. Uh, so you can see how even in, and remember the reason St. Miletus of Antioch was elected and the reason Akakius did all this wasn't just because of Jovian. There was massive pressure, even from a figure like Paulinus of Antioch, all right, who had been around as a, as a loyal priest along with other priests who had never recognized the deposition of St. Eustathius back in 335. Yeah. Uh, they've been persecuted. They just simply kept going and going and going. It, they were not simply restricted to Antioch. Some people claim that. Uh, Rufinus of Aquileia, who lived in the East in his ecclesiastical history, says that, you know, there were in one city you might have a Meladian bishop, in another city in the East you might have a Paulinian bishop. All right. So they were. So, so what happened was um, that put pressure, if you know what I mean, on sort of the on the people in the kind of the official court church that claimed they were Orthodox to actually take action. Yeah. Right, and those people took action. It sort of snowballed, and eventually we get to the Second Ecumenical Council, which is partially not just to condemn Macedonian heresy and Apollinarianism, but also reconcile these different Orthodox parties. All right, yeah. so that that sort of I mean an exam. I mean, it, it, and it mostly worked. There were some problems after that in the three eighties and nineties and such. It still continued, but you can see how that situation turned out. All right, uh, another example. Um, in uh, the iconoclast heresy and schism, all right. So, iconoclasts are anathematized by the Church of Old Rome in 729. They're anathematized again in 731. There's actually a, a, a more formal council held in 731 in Rome. Uh, that's held in the uh, on November 1st. That's actually the we think the origin of the uh, reason for the change of the feast of All Saints in Rome from like May 26 to November 1st. People erroneously say that All Saints was celebrated November 1st first. As, like it was somehow related to the Irish old Samhain, which is totally fallacious. There's no evidence about that, by the way. Um, so uh, the iconic class were declared to be schism and, her and schism and heresy. Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria in the 730s and 40s had similar councils. Rome held had like, something like two or three extra councils over the years. Like every decade, they hold a council anathematizing um, Constantinople as a, a iconoclast and schismatic during the uh, iconoclast heresy. 
Well, what happens is um, around 780, I believe, there is a, um, a Cypriot, pri Cypriot, Cypriot priest who uh, somehow ends up in Constantinople, all right? And uh, he is elected and chosen by the iconoclasts in the imperial government to be Patriarch of Constantinople. All right, and this is called this is man's called Patriarch Paul the Fourth. Well, if you uh, I can um, read up. a bit. Yes. Hold okay. Up. This translation, by the way, is uh, a public domain translation of the Acts of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, uh, done in English by an Anglican with some pretty. Um, Pretty angry footnotes, but it's a good translation. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Is it scrolling down as I scroll down? Yes, it is. Okay. Can you make it a little bit? Can we? Can we? Can I make it a little bit bigger? Let me see if I can. Um, is it getting bigger? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. Okay. All right. So this is the letter of Saint Tarasius. Um, I believe it's the letter he wrote to Pope Saint Adrian explaining the situation, why they need to call the council, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Okay. For when the most holy patriarch Paul, that's who we're talking about, by the divine will was about to be liberated from the bands of mortality and ex to exchange his earthly pilgrimage for a heavenly home with his master Christ, he abdicated the patriarch. This is around 785 he did this. And took upon him the monastic life. And when we asked him, why hast thou done this? He answered, because I fear that if death should surprise me still in the episcopate of this royal and heaven-defended city, Constantinople, I should have to carry with me the anathema of the whole Catholic Church, which consigns me to that outer darkness which is prepared for the devil and his angels. For they say that a certain synod hath been held here in order to the subversion of pictures and images, which the church receives, retains, and worships, or venerates, older translation just means venerates, by the way, in memory of the persons whom they represent. This is that which distracts my soul. This is that which makes me anxious to inquire how I may escape the judgment of God, since among, all, since among such men I have been brought up, and with such am I numbered. Then St. Teresa says, No sooner... Had he thus spoken in the presence of some of the most illustrious nobles, then he expires. So the background is this. Patriarch Paul IV becomes patriarch. He, he, as he gets near the end of his life, he realizes that this whole iconoclasm thing, it's, it's a, we're in schism and heresy. All right? He, 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 can't, he can't serve anymore. He retires and joins a monastery, probably one of those connected to the studio. Many of the monasteries in, uh, in Asia Minor actually were... Uh, never in communion with the iconoclasts, so they were sort of separated from them. So um, there's other accounts that says the emperor, like St. Teresius at this time, by the way, was like I think a military commander of some sort. Uh, the empress, the senate went out to visit him, the nobles that he talks about, and this is the answer he gave. He said, look, I, we're in, we're in schism and heresy, and I'm not going, I can't, I can't continue to serve in this condition. All right, and then he dies, all right? Uh, when our pious sovereignty reflect, reflected on this awful declaration, Okay, so this is actually the imperial letter, by the way. Uh, we took counsel with ourselves as to what ought to be done. And we determined after mature deliberations that when a new patriarch had been elected, we should endeavor to bring this subject, okay, down past the absurd note, to some decisive conclusion. We're having summoned those whom we knew to be most experienced in ecclesiastical matters and having called upon Christ our God, we consulted with them who was worthy, uh, them who was worthy to be exalted to the chair of the priesthood of this royal and heaven within the city, and they all, with one heart and soul, gave their vote in favor of Tarasius, he who now occupies the pontifical presidency. Having therefore sent for him, we laid before him our deliberations and our vote, but he would by no means consent, nor at all yield to that which had been determined. And when we, that, that's the emperors. Uh, inquired wherefore he thus refused his consent at first he answered evasively that the yoke of the chief priesthood was too much for him but we know but i'm sorry but we knowing this to be a mere pretext covered his unwillingness to obey us 
would not desist from our importunity, but persisted in passing the acceptance of the dignity of the chief, chief priesthood upon him. When he found out how urgent we were with him, he told us that the cause of his refusal, quote, it is, said he, because I perceive that the church, which has been founded on the rock of Christ our God, is rent and torn asunder by schisms, and that we are unstable in our confession, and that Christians in the East of the same faith with ourselves decline communion with us. That Who is that? That's Antioch, Alexandria, Jerusalem. They were not communion with Constantinople. They considered them in schism and heresy. And unite themselves to those in the West, that's Rome. And we are so estranged from all, and each day are anathematized by all. And moreover, I should demand that an ecumenic council should be held at which should be found legates from the Pope of Rome and from the chief priests of the East. We therefore, fully understanding these things, introduced him to the assembled company of the priests, of our most illustrious princes, and of all our Christian people. And then in their presence, he repeated to them all that he had said before us, which when they heard, they received him joyfully and earnestly entreated our peacemaking and pious sovereignty that an ecumenic council might be assembled. To this, they request, we gave our hearty consent, for to speak the truth, it is by the good will and under the direction of our God that we have established you together. All right, so I mean, we can go on, but notice how um, when they wanted to bring St. Teresa as patriarch, his conditions were, look, if you want to do this, we're going to have to end this, uh, we're going to have to basically have an ecumenical council uh, to end the schism and heresy um, we're in and unite with the, uh, the rest of the right, right and, church. Right? And, and that was his demand, and, and he's, that, that's an example of what? That's a successful fighting from when, for, for lack of a better word, it's just fighting. You know? Well, it's, it's important to one thing I want to point out is that many times people operate, and this is especially true with heterodox, particularly Roman Catholics, that they believe that the purpose of an ecumenical council is to resolve a disputed question. As you can see from this, that's not what's happening here. What's happening is that Tarasius is asking for uh, this ecumenical council to be held to finally resolve once and for all the orthodox teaching for everybody. Everybody is already in agreement on it. In other words, it's not um, it's not like they didn't know whether iconoclasm was wrong. They did. Remember, Patriarch Paul was dying and saying, and that, that was why he retired. He couldn't serve anymore because, right. because of what was happening. Yeah. His conscience bothered him. Yes. So continue. Sorry. Um, uh, okay. Um, this is based. I'm going to get to the other section of the council because I think it had some important points. For the beginning of the council, basically, uh, the bishops and Saint Teresius are affirming their rejection of, um, you know, the of rejection of iconoclasm. Uh, they rejected. There was an iconoclast council that was calling itself the seventh. There was pseudo council. They they anathematized that. Um. So now, notice this was the first part of the council. So were there Orthodox bishops at the council? Yes. The, 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 I think there were Cypriot bishops, but also the bishops from Sardinia showed up, all right? Um, the Metropolitan of Catania, I believe, was there, who's the Archbishop of Sardinia. And there were legates from Rome and things like that. But um, So they had some Orthodox bishops, but the point was, is before there's going to be any kind of concelebration, any, they want to hear from the former iconoclasts um, who had made also St. Teresius that they rejected and anathematized all heresies, including iconoclasm. All right. So it wasn't like, oh, they're meet. I mean, it wasn't like they're meeting together, and they're going to just, oh, well, well, let's discuss whether this is true or not. Like you said, this is actually similar to the Sixth Ecumenical Council. When it came together, um, the, um, at the at the very beginning of it, the Patriarch of Constantinople went over to the to the side to one side of the aisle that was uh, led by. Um, uh, the legates uh, from uh, Rome and other Orthodox bishops, and he announced he was ortho. He, you know, accepted two, two energies and two wills. And then the first session was essentially um, a declaration about the Orthodox doctrine, in which after which they asked, you know, Macarius of Antioch. If he didn't, and so he eventually got deposed. But so um, notice, Patriarch Teresi says, "All this our, that is after the correct doctrinal confession, all this our sacerdotal assembly unite in giving thanks and praise to God for this thy confession, which has now been made by thee to the Catholic Church, the Holy Council, is glory be to God." Um, now we're going to get to um, 
another issue here, which I think is worthy of discussion. It should be noted that this was the first time that we had what would, would be known as the Synodicon, which was read today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The Synodicon is based upon the uh, the memory eternals and the anathemas of the Seventh Communical Council. Mm -hmm. And it has been appended ever since. Yep, okay, absolutely. continue on. Sorry. Um, and here are some anathemas, by the way. Anathema mm -hmm. to those who worship not the holy and venerable images. This is, it should be venerate not the holy and venerable icons. This is just an older translation. Um, Written by a very okay. upset angle. But I mean, it is. Act I mean, I have the 2020 uh, translation. So the Richard Price, Price, yeah, yeah. It, it's still it's it's it's, just, it's basically almost identical, except he uses modern English. Oh, okay. Well, this is it's better that it's not modern English. So this is still pretty good. Uh, okay, so there were other problems at the council. I think are sort of worth addressing. Um, so we noticed there's a figure at the council called Sabas. Saint Sabas, who's abbot of the Monastery of Studium. This is, I think, he was the uncle, I believe, um, of Saint Theodore Sudite. Um, okay, so, okay, so the question now is, what should be done with those who are the former iconoclast bishops that they can be re that they can repent and be accepted into the church through repentance from schism and heresy? That's not a debate, okay? And a layperson can be accepted that way, right? The question is, what should be done with people who were claiming to be bishops, who were consecrated by schismatic heretics, who in turn were consecrated by schismatic heretics? All right? Uh, that's a much more uh, a serious issue. So... Um, yeah, because uh, yeah, the, the Seventh Council dealt with situations where... For lack of a better word, uh, people who weren't canonically ordained but still held the correct confession. Um, I assume that's what you're looking for. Yeah, I, I'm trying to get to the section that we're going to talk about that because it's very, it's actually rather important. Okay, so they the, they basically establishing that, oh, yeah, you, you, okay. All right, all right, so here's the issue, okay. All right. Okay, so notary, the Constantine Notary of the Venerable Patriarch had said, according to the command of your holiness, we have brought hither the sacred books taken from the library of the Venerable Patriarchate of Constantinople, among which are the canons of the Holy Apostles and of the Holy Councils, the works of our Holy Father Basil and other Holy Fathers. Tarasius says, let the book of canonical order be read first. The Holy Council says, let it be read. So Constantine the Notary reads the 53rd uh, Apostolic Canon. Quote, if any presbyter refuseth to receive him that turns from his sins, but rejecteth him, let him be deposed, since he grieves Christ, who has who hath said, There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. The Sabas and the monks said, This is manifest and admitted by all, that the church admits every one who is penitent. Tarasius, there is another canon on this point. Constantine the notary reads the eighth canon of the, of the Council of Nicaea. With respect to those who call themselves Catharai, that's the Novatians, by the way, not to be confused with the Cathars of the 12th century. With respect to those who call themselves Catharai, Catharai, if they come over to the Catholic and Apostolic Church, the Holy Council decrees that they who are ordained shall, shall remain in the order of the clergy, but that, first of all, it is requisite that they profess in writing that they will agree to and follow the decrees of the Catholic Church. That is, that they will communicate with those who have married again, and with those who have lapsed in time of persecution, who have a time given in a term fixed for their penance, and that they will in every other respect follow the doctrine of the Catholic and Apostolic Church, and that when in any town or village they alone are found to be ordained, they who are among the clergy should remain in the same order. Theodore, Bishop of Catania, uh, that's, I believe he was uh, the primate of, of uh, the Orthodox Bishops of Sardinia says, the canon now re read hath no relation to heresy. So, you know, they're talking about this. Theresius nay, says, nay, it refers to every heresy. Epiphanius, the deacon of Catania, and the vicar of Thomas, Archbishop of Sardinia. I'm sorry, Thomas was the Archbishop of Sardinia. Um, Epiphanius says, this canon was enacted then only concerning the Cathare. St. Theresius replies, in what way then must we treat this, now, this, now her this new heresy lately sprung up in our time? John, vicar of the See of Antioch, says, heresy separates what? Father Joseph, heresy separates every man from, every the, man church. from the church. Yeah. The council says, this is very evident. The monks said, 
the canon declares that those who have received imposition of hands should be admitted. So by imposition of hands here, they, they mean... Uh, or the is, what are they, what, Well, this is the question. St. Theresius says, how are we to understand this imposition of hands? They're in reference to the reception of novations. The monks said, my lord, we entreat that you would instruct us. This is Theresius. Perhaps this imposition of hands may be understood of blessing, not of ordination. The princes, I guess that's the imperial uh, uh, emperors, uh, the imper imperial uh, representative says, say, if there be no other impediments, let them be admitted for their penitence according to the canons. Perisius says, let us inquire into other canons also, which relate to the, re to the remaining heresies. The council says, we request this also. Let the canons be brought forward. Now, notice how everything is, how they're doing everything, Father Joseph. Yeah. They're, they're not just Procedural. speculating about things. We're saying, what do the canons say? Now we want, we, they were going to eventually get to what? Canonical precedents, historical records. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's, that's how, that's how Orthodox people do things. They don't just say, well, you know, elder so-and-so 20 years said this, 25, yeah. 30 years ago said this. All right. Be, you know. Right. You have Constantine, to go back to the canons. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Constantine the notary read the third canon of the Council of Ephesus, which says, we pronounce it right that if any of the clergy that are in any city or country have been prohibited the exercise of their sacerdotal functions by Nestorius or his partisans on account of their orthodoxy, they be restored to their proper rank. We wholly forbid any who do now or hereafter shall agree with this holy ecumenical council to submit in any, res any respects to those bishops who have apostatized or shall apostatize from the Orthodox faith or transgress against the holy canons. So just from background, when Nestorius took over as Patriarch of Constantinople, I think 427, 428, uh, it, after, I think, about four or five months, people began to complain about things he was saying, all right? Uh, and this led to a number of uh, clergy, archimandrites, priests, deacons, etc., uh, simply ceasing commemoration of Nestorius. All right, and Nestorius basically deposed him. He he said, "Oh, the canons say you have to commemorate your bishop," which is true. But the canons don't say you have to commemorate a heretical bishop. All right. Um, so Nestorius deposed a number of these people. But the Third Ecumenical Council's position was what that. Um, you know, these people uh, are restored to their proper rank, all right? And they also command what? They also command that no one in the future is to submit in any respect to those bishops who have apostatized, or in the future, that's shall, shall apostatize from the Orthodox faith, or even transgress against the Holy Canons, all right? Brissius says, this canon seems to be more on the point in question, yet let the other canons be read. Stephen, who is the monk and librarian of the Sacred Patriarch, it says, We have here the letter of our father Basil, now among the saints, on this very subject under inquiry, namely, whether they who return from heresy are admissible to the priesthood, and if ye will, let them be read. The council says, let it be read, and Stephen reads the letter of St. Basil to St. Amphilochius, which begins as follows. We ought to consider the malignity of the Incritites. Incritites were, heres were a group of uh, schismatic heretics that date back as to the mid-century, second century, they come from Tatian. Um, they generally were orthodox in their doctrine, like on the Trinity, I believe, uh, and a number of other points. But they, they, I think they held views like you should only use water in the Eucharist, or you shouldn't eat meat. Right, because they were, they were against meat and wine. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. And they, yeah. Um, but uh, they weren't, I mean, they were heretics, but they, in schismatics, but they're, they weren't like Arians or something like that. All right, so that question is, how do you treat this group? So St. Basil says, we ought to consider the malignity of the Incritites, who in order to render themselves inadmissible to the church, have endeavored to be beforehand with her by a baptism of their own. And in so doing, they have transgressed their own rule. As there is not at present anything openly determined concerning them, I give it as my opinion that we ought not to omit their baptism. Um, now, but if anybody ever comes out and says, well, there are other heresies, the Incritites, okay, fine. I'm, I'm not, I, I just believe, I don't think they had a Trinitarian heresy. I don't think. No, they didn't. St. Basil's, Basil's position is that there was no other previous determination, so I'm just going to say baptize them all, okay? But to baptize all who have been received by them who, when they come to the Catholic Church. But if our regulation, which that economia, okay, be at all likely to interfere with the Catholic Church, we must resort again to the former custom, 
I'm sorry, there were former, there was a former custom, okay, and follow the rules which the Holy Fathers have handed down to us. For I am afraid, lest while we are endeavoring to discourage their baptism, that is discourage, um, uh, to, to condemn their baptism, we should prove any hindrance to those who might be saved by the severity of our sentence. But if they respect our baptism, this must not move us since we are not bound so much to return the obligation as accurately to observe the canons. This rule we must by all means most carefully observe, namely that everyone who comes over to us from their baptism must be anointed by the faithful and so approach the mysteries. I know that we have admitted to the Episcopal chair brethren who were of the party of Evisois and Saturninus, even though they have been ordained by them. And I think, uh, therefore, that we have no longer at that we are no longer at liberty to separate from the church those who have been in communion with them, since we have made a kind of order for their admission to communion by the reception of their bishops. Um, so I think Saint Basil says that look, he prefer baptizing the Incretites, but if if this sort of severe, if this uh, you might say acrovia, is in any way hindering con significant conversions of Incretites then anointing with chrism is, is acceptable, all right? Yeah. Um, he talks about Izoas and Saturninus, they're Arians. Uh, that's Izoas of, they were they were ordained by Achacius of Caesarea, I think. Achacius of Caesarea, by the way, was deposed by the Council of Sardica in 344. Um, that Council of Sardica is, was a, pan, was, um, was a, is a council, it's not, it's never called an ecumenical council, uh, but it's, it was it's in the Pedalion. It was accepted by the Orthodox East and the West. It's yeah, it's a pan pan yeah. Exactly. So when people say, well, Achacius, he could still do ordinations because he was just publicly preaching areas and hadn't been deposed. Well, no, no, no. Achacius had been deposed by Sardica. Uh, both St. Hilary of Portiers, St. Athanasius, St. Theodore all record that. All right. We have the Acts. All right. So he was deposed. Um, but notice that they had uh, made a kind of order for the admission to communion of of basically Arian bishops, right. who are so called bishops, all right, without necessarily reordaining them. Um, and this is why this is being brought up, okay? So the monk said, we entreat that the letter of St. Athanasius to Raphidian be brought. The council says, let it be brought. Um, in the meantime, I guess, so there, So, if, what you're, if you read the Acts, it says, let it be brought according to the request of the most, holy, most religious monks. It says, during the interval, so this is like an. You, <laughs> they have to get it out of the library. Yeah, exactly. They're having to go to get get it out of the library. Yeah. So in, during the interval, Leontius oh, the said, well, in the meantime, see, yeah. yeah, in the in the meantime, let the other epistles of Saint Basil be read. All right. So all right. Stephen the librarian read from the epistle of a holy father Basil to the uh, Evacinians. Quote: Saint Basil says those whom last year they sent for uh, sent for from Galatia. Sorry, I don't have my glasses with me. That by their means they might obtain the confidence of the bishops, were such as might easily be discerned on a very slight acquaintance with them. And shortly after, quote, if they say that they have repented, let them exhibit in writing their repentance and their anathema of the faith of Constantinople. That's because Constantinople was controlled by Arians at the time. And their separation from heretics, and let them not deceive the simple. Also from the epistle of St. Basil to the bishops of the West, quote, there is one of them that hath caused us so much vexa us, us much vexation. I mean Eustathius, Bishop of Sebastia in Lesser Armenia. He was at first a disciple of Arius, at a time when he was in the height of his celebrity at Alexandria, constructing his malignant blasphemies against the only begotten Son of God, and was attached to him as one of his most decided followers. On his return to his own country, however, this Eustathius offered a confession of sound faith to Hermogenes, the most blessed bishop of Caesarea, who had condemned him for his impious opinion. And then, though he was consecrated by him, yet no sooner was Hermogenes dead than he had hastens to Eusebius, bishop of Constantinople, who was inferior to none in the vigor with which he upheld the impieties of Arius. Being, however, for some cause or other expelled from that place, he once more returned to his own country and again made an apology for his conduct, veiling the impiety of his real sentiments under the guise of orthodoxy, and in this way obtained his bishopric. But no sooner had he obtained it than it appeared that he had subscribed the anathema against the homoousion, that's the orthodox doctrine, at the conventicle held at Ankira, and, th and that from thence he hastened to Seleucia. 
and what things he and his party did there everyone knows. And after that, he again declared his agreement to the propositions of the heretics of Constantinople. Wherefore, he was again ejected from his bishopric on the ground of a prior ejectment at Melatine. And the only way of restoration which seemed left to him was an appeal to you. That is to the bishops of the West, all right? But what now, now St. Basil, just to stop here, is writing this to the bishops of the West because he's saying, look, a lot of Arians who get who have been deposed or, you know, they came to us. They lied to us. We, we made them bishops. We deposed them, all right, or something like that. They're now appealing to people in the West because why? They're, nobody really quite has an understanding of all the affairs happening, all right? So St. Bees was trying to say, look, don't, don't have anything to do with these people. But what may be the determination of Liberius of Rome towards him or what he may choose to say for himself, I do not pretend to affirm. All I know is that he has taken with him the same letter of restoration, which having exhibited at the Synod of Tyana, he recovered his dignity. So um, the, the context behind this, again, is many of these like Arian bishops, I think after Julian the Apostate died or something, kind of went to Rome. Uh, they kind of convinced St. Liberius to, you know, a lot of them came and said, oh, we accept the Nicene Creed. All right, that's just how they, how they acted. Uh, St. Liberius said, well, that's great. Okay, now you're in communion with me. All right. Well, St. Basil, technically, as far as I understand, he may have been on friendly terms with the Bishop of the West, but he wasn't really at that point in communion with Rome or Alexandria. All right. So he's sort of in that position warning them. Um, but this is causing problems for St. Basil because there are now these bishops who are Arians who come know, back and claim that they have Rome support. Yeah, exactly. And, and, they're, and, they're, and they're Orthodox now, they'll be Arian tomorrow, in other words. All right. Uh, so uh, that's the end of that letter. Okay. Then the Acts continued. There was read also another epistle of the same father to Count Terentius. I think we've talked about that in another letter, uh, show. Yeah, we have. In which, in which he declares that he had received and communicated with the, this Eustathius on his return from heresy. All right. Uh, Stephen, the notary, uh, read from the definition of the Third Ecumenical Council against the impious Massalians or Eukites, saying, it hath seemed good to us and to the most reverend Valerian and Infolochius and to all the bishops of the province of Laconia and Pamphylia that all things written in the synodical chart shall not be in force, uh, shall be in force, I'm sorry, and by no means be transgressed and that the decrees from Alexandria also shall be in like manner confirmed. Wherefore, we will that all in every province who actually belong to the sect of the Messalians, that is the enthusiasts, or all who have be, may be suspected of laboring under this disease, whether clerics or laymen, be assembled together. And if they then anathematize the heresy according to the above mentioned synodical chart, that those who are in orders retain their orders, and that the laymen be received into communion with the church. Peter the notary, having in his hands read from the commonatorium of a holy father, Kirill of Alexandria, to Maximus, uh, the deacon of Antioch. Quote. I've heard how many from the more of these are there? This is this, it's a pretty long list. Uh, pardon me. Oh, how many more of these are? Because uh, let through. me get. Let, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, I I'd, I'd like to read through all of. I mean, I've read it numerous times, but let's kind of get down to uh, more something more specific. Okay. Right. As um, we could go on and on, they, they they because they're they're going through various letters about what about people who were ordained by heretics, what about people who became what? heretics after they yeah, were they're, ordained. Yeah, they're going, they're looking for for the details and the canons and the traditions of the church as to what exactly they should do with these people. Yeah, exactly. Okay, because the monks are objecting to the iconoclast to receiving the iconoclast bishops without basically a new reordination. That's that's the problem. Right. All right. Um. Okay, so the monks, so after all this, there's there's another letter. He's, the monks say, See, as we have said before, the fathers admit none to the priesthood who have returned from heresy. Therese says, It is not as you suppose. For the father does not admit, he's talking about, I think, St. Athanasius to Raphinian, does not admit to the priesthood those who, not having but, originated but the, heresy, they were not the originators of heresy, but were seduced or violently drawn asunder or aside. Okay. Well, he excludes those only who were the actual originators or violent promoters of the same. So, in other words, if you're the guy who starts the heresy or the schism, the church generally is not is once you're deposed, they're not they're not taking you back, right? right? If you're the second or third generation of schismatic or heretics and you kind of kept that outward form of ordination, there is there is some leniency through economy for being used there. It doesn't mean we recognize the orders, but there is there is leniency. 
All right. Uh, I think uh, we could go through all of this, but I think if somebody is really interested, they should. If they're really serious about these questions, they need to read the first session of the Seventh Day Communal Council. I've, I've, I've told people that before. For some reason, um, a lot of people want to talk about the issue without reading this. This is, in fact, the highest. We can say this is the highest level discussion ever held in the Orthodox Church uh, at, the, at the first yeah. session of this matter. All right. Um, and I want to get a little bit further down. Um, uh to just uh finish up and we can we can maybe just finish up our discussion okay all right letter of saint athanasius um macarius the heretic okay um okay so peter the presbyter and legate of adrian says as historians tell us saint melidius was ordained by the arians uh, yet when he ascended the pulpit or the ambo, ambon, and preached the consubstantiality, his ordination was never disapproved. Theodore of Catania and the bishops of Sicily with him say, the arch-presbyter of the apostolic chair has spoken truly. Parisia says, in no respect do we find the fathers at variance with each other, but all as under the influence of the same spirit ever preach and teach the same. Um, and one more point to bring up. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the monks agree. Uh, yeah, the monks point. finally have, they, they presented enough evidence of the monks like, okay, that's enough. We we see that this can be done. All right. Uh, they bring up some other issues about a simony because it turns out almost all the iconic class bishops had been simonically ordained, which was another, no. which was another, which is another problem. Um, okay. And one more point to bring up is the St. Interesse says, you see how even for eight months the archbishop persisted exhorting and forbearing with them, and though he knew that all at all the time they were under the anathema of the council, but we have now heard both canonical regulations. Okay. Um, there is one other section from St. Teresi I want to read before we just leave off on this completely. Um, there's at one point where... Um, the bishops well, basically. I think it's from what you're looking at right here. No. No. Well, Saint, um, no, no, no. There's another point. There's a one point where the bishops basically say that they were all ordained and born in heresy. So that that's it's the the difference I, is that you're not talking about people who were ordained in the church, and that that's 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 the whole that's the whole problem. All right. Okay. Um, it's, a big, it's a big session, so bear with us. Yeah, I know. I'm not trying to extend it out. But okay. Okay. Uh, the monks say, see how this father, I think they're talking about St. Basil, uh, abominates. I'm not going to read the entire letter of St. Basil, which is up there above, but uh, the monks, um, again, the kind of monks aren't quite convinced, again. All right. They say, see how this father, St. Basil, abominates the ordination of heretics. For he says, I would not rank him among the priests of Christ who is raised to that dignity by the profane hands for the destruction of the faith. So. St. Teresius utters a statement here, which is, in fact, um, has some importance for Kiprinos and others. All right. right. Because it, this is actually interesting. St. Teresius says, and I also abominate those who are ordained for any such purpose as the destruction of the faith. And much more if there were at the time Orthodox bishops from whom ordination might have been had. And this is, and this is I apprehend, all that the fathers intend. And so, after a synodical decree has been framed and the orthodox agreement of the church has been established, if any should presume to go to profane heretics for ordination, let him be liable to deposition. The council says this judgment is just. It's the phrase after a synodical decree has been framed and the orthodox agreement of the church has been established. That's sort of this issue is what is he saying here, in other words. Right. right? Um, anyway... Uh, it, it's very clear to me, anyway. But we could go one and one. I think there's is actually a very important. Um, it, it is, and I think that a lot of people do have that question. Like you know, they have the question of, well, if this person's heretical. Like that, a lot of people ask these questions, but these questions have all been answered. Actually, 13th century. I should point out this: this is not Saint Teresius saying that they per se believe. Oh, there's inward consecrating grace and schism. And right, he's not not even close. Yes. Now, there is a question. The only question you could have is 
He says people going to heretics for ordinations is prohibited after a synodical decree and orthodox agreement. Um, you know, the, and the question is, what is he talking about there? Because obviously today that you're not going to find any church father that says, well, if you can't find orthodox bishop, go to the Nestorian bishop or something like that. Right. Right. Uh, I think what he's speaking here in the context of St. Meletius would be something like, well, if there are people claim, if there are people who were sort of like, I hate to use word sort of heretics, but uh, like a Cacius of Caesarea, these, these individuals who are heretics, but they're kind of hiding the heresy, so to speak. Um, they're set there in some degree separated from the other Orthodox bishops. A lot of times people did go to them for ordination. All right. Uh, like Meletius of Antioch, all right, as the council affirms. Um, that was ex that was considered acceptable on those difficult times, but that was not considered, a, you know, in other words, a permanent solution. Right? No. Because it, we want to see Meletius did. He got ordained, and then, and maybe, yeah, maybe he was quiet for two years, then he becomes Bishop of Antioch, and he proclaims orthodoxy, and he turns against all, all these people who sort of, you know, he, they thought he was on their side, he turns against them. All right. So if you are fighting from within, when are you going to do when are you going to imitate St. Meletius, in other words? All right. St. Meletius didn't say, well, let's just stay with the heretics for 80 years. All right. I mean, maybe after maybe several generations will take. Yeah, over from within. exactly. All right. And that's anyway, what, that's, um, I think that but it is definitely relevant to the question that, we, that comes to us today, because the question becomes like, how long does it go on? And I think the answer to the question is pretty obvious this year, that once there are Orthodox bishops available who are proclaiming the faith truly, you have to go under them, especially for something as deep as ordination. Um, and so that's something that is uh, that needs to be taken. And, 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 look, and look at what St. Saint, uh, Saint Teresa says. He says, uh, but this divine father, St. Basil, at the time when they were so many Orthodox bishops, had reason to forbid the son to the church to make use of Arian ordination. So in other words, if you have St. Meletius, don't keep on going to a, he's already, he's already there. Don't go to Acacius anymore. Right. All right. Don't go to, I don't know, um, Eudoxus of, of Constantinople or whoever. I mean, the, the, the break has already happened. There's no need to go, to go to them. All right. Okay. And so, yeah, that's, I, I mean, it's, it's definitely relevant. I mean, it, ultimately, and as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, when we were discussing the history of fighting from within, um, ultimately it, it's not totally, um, actually, but it's not relevant anymore because there's no, when you're fighting from within, you're literally fighting against your own hierarchy and usually in opposition to it, you're just going to be, seen as disobedient, which would be technically true. The proper thing to do is to place your obedience under Orthodox bishops. All right. Uh, do we have any questions, Father, in the chat? Um, I, there was a there was a question about the uh, Ro, the ROAC uh, directory, but Father Mark answered that. Father Mark actually does have a question, and he said he said, uh, "Hold on, I would say that given how fast information can be seen and communicated today, it greatly shortens this gray area, right?" Uh, yeah, I would say that that's, uh, I mean, at least uh, from my end, it's unprecedented in how uh, the way information travels now. So, yeah, it's very easy. I don't, it's not easy. It's, it's got its own spiritual crises, et cetera, to do. But the point is the path is there. And it's... Although, when it comes I, I, to, I, let's be frank. Some of this wasn't gray back in the 350s or 40s. No. Um, I mean, they, they, people knew who they, they were Aryan, like Akakius was an Aryan. That wasn't, he wasn't really hiding that. Um, right. And, you know, there, there's, now he may have, I think what, what happened was this, if you had approached Akakius of Caesarea in the three, like, especially after, even after he got deposed. Uh, so he is deposed. All right. So, okay. So you approach him and you say, would you believe the son of God is God? Akakius would say yes. Now, if he just say, well, it's a mystery, I don't want to talk about it to you because you're just a lay person, you don't understand, all right? If you were another bishop who were, he felt was friendly to you, he'd just straight up say, oh, well, the divine properties of the essence are communicated to the Logos, but the Logos was created, all right? So in other words, that's Arianism, all right? Because the, the Logos doesn't just have properties communicated to him. He is of the same essence as the Father. Right. All right. So, I mean, Akakius would still in, in, preach Arianism in, in, his, in his own way. But like Oxentius of Milan, 
uh, they would phrase these things in such a way as to avoid uh, too overt a problem. All right. But remember, St. Athanasius and people like him, they, they knew what was going on. That's why they did not communicate with the likes of Acacius or Exentius of Milan and all the rest. All right. Um, and Exentius of Milan was even worse. At one point, well, he was probably just as bad as Acacius. At one point, the uh, the emperor actually held a council and called 12 bishops and said, look, we're going to settle this once and for all. Exentius of Milan shows up. Um, he had already been preaching Arianism. And they said, do you accept the Nicene Creed? And he says, yes. Well, this this leaves Saint Hilary Portieris with what egg on his face, all right? Right. Because he had he had Exentius had claimed he deposed Saint Hilary, he was persecuting him in the Orthodox. Well, then he then Exentius shows him says, yeah, yeah, I accept the Nicene Creed. You know, he just lies, in other words. Yeah, and there, right. there are people still doing that. Uh, people still doing that today, and but it's so much easier to expose. And I think that was. Point, yeah, that... no, I think, I, yes, yes, exactly. It's very difficult. To, I mean, you can't have miscommunication today even worse than, than previously, probably, too. But you can have you can also expose the truth. And if you're and mm -hmm. if you're misunderstood, you have a way to respond a lot quicker. Exactly. Right? Uh, and, um, and, and, OK, go ahead. Oh, it looks like we have a question, but it's half complete. It just says uh, I have a question to the local synod or council. I'm assuming that there is another part to that question, um, but uh, we'll give it a minute, um, but yeah, it's uh, it definitely is. Um, we're in in twenty twenty three. It's very difficult to say that we can uh, that we can. Oh, there's the question. Okay, uh, does the local senator council have the power to bind and loose? Can an anathema be given in a given in a local to apply to all other local churches? Um, I would say yes, but not exactly. Like the churches have local boundaries, and so the anathema would apply through everyone that they have jurisdiction over. But anathemas on heresies, um, if they're heresies, are universally true by their nature. In other words, you can't have like a local synod uh, condemning Arianism, for example, doesn't mean that the question outside of the boundaries of that particular synod um, are irrelevant. That's not how it works. Truth is truth. So all it takes is a local senate or council to bind and loose, uh, and if they're proclaiming the truth, it will filter its way through the church. Well, there, um, remember, if, if, if somebody secretly, you know, comes to believe and teach a heresy, even though they're hiding it from everyone else, uh, what what's happening is they're in deadly sin. God is separating them. Right. Yeah. So even like I even if you had like a like a this is the question about secret heretics. Obviously, if someone's a bishop or a priest and they have a secret heresy, you know, you there's and you're they're part of the church. They're they're formally part of the church. There's no way knowing it without God telling you directly or them explaining themselves. That's why like Canon 15 of the first second council says public preaching. All right. Bareheaded. All right. Because you could have someone's like the story of uh, Theodore Mops West here. All right. I obviously held heretical views that he was sometimes shot. He sometimes retracted how he expressed them. All right. So he could retain his seat. All right. Now, does that mean Theodore Mopsuestia's consecrations when he made a bishop or priest or, or, or the Eucharist were valid still? Well, he was still formally part of the church, if you know what I mean. Uh, and he had, to, and you can have that with, with times when heretics aren't expressing their teachings, they're still formally part of the church. Uh, the priesthood obviously is God's; it's not their personal property. But once they publicly start, you know, doing these things, then you then it becomes a different issue. All right. right. Uh, the other point. So there's that heavenly anathema that, that you can't you can't escape that. All right. Even if you can escape deposition or whatever, you know, if you die believing something that you know is a heresy, you know, obviously you, you're going to have you're not going you're not uh you're going. I, be judgmental but you're going to hades not the good part of hades there's not that is a good part all right um uh, the other point is when you when local council issues an anathema um other churches have to also understand what is being anathematized mm -hmm. right so if um you know a church anathematizes let's say like a let's say a local council in 570 anathematizes orthodocitism okay which was like Julian of Heliconarsis' yeah. mm -hmm. Well, if I'm the church, if I'm like a church in Spain or in Fregol, uh, and, you know, they come in and they say, we're anathematizing orthodicitism, and I, I have no idea what they're talking about. And I mean, the bishops there just may not put it on an anathema. They just may not know what the whole issue is about. 
All right. So they don't automatically fall under anathema because they don't because it's, they don't even if you know what I'm trying to say, they haven't even heard of the heresy. Right. Right. So there has to be some exposure to the issue. They have to know what's actually happening. I ha hate to say this, but it also can't be a made up heresy. If you know what you know, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You can't just invent something that Ask me something that people are holding. Yeah, it, it can't just be a, it's something invented in your own mind uh, for political purposes or what have you. I mean, if if you start inventing heresies and claiming people are holding them, you actually yourself might be a heretic. All right, because you know you may hold some weird views anyway. Um, but yeah, I'd say a local count a local councils and athemas uh, can't have uh, you know a, a, a binding authority, but you have also have to take into account how much do other local churches know about it. All right. or, or are experiencing it. Like, for example, exactly. we talk about the anathema against ecumenism. That was one local council of Rohor. The entire world knew about it, though. The entire yeah. world has picked up on it and knows exactly what it's about. This is not a, a um, it's not a, how shall I put this? It's, it's been not 40 a years now. pure issue. It, it, you know, I, I hate to say it, but you can compare it to name worshiping. Um, name worshiping is weird and obscure by contrast, but ecumenism is pretty obvious pretty well known all over the place and it's not like this is like some like secret thing i mean you can just google news and you'll well, pull up hundreds of yeah. articles about ecumenical meetings and stuff they're all prohibited by the canon yeah and, and also remember if and with some of these uh some some ecumenists if you go to them and you say do you believe the orthodox church is the church christ founded many ecumenists in the patriarchates will say yes of course we do Right, mm -hmm. but their other teachings, if I mean, some of them probably don't, but many of their other teachings essentially deny that, all right, and their practices, all right. So, just like you could go to Auxantius of Milan after his meeting with the emperor and the 10 bishops or 12 bishops, and he could say, Yeah, I accept the Nicene Creed. Well, then he goes back to preaching, then he goes back to Arianism, just preaching Arianism, all right. I, I think uh, a perfect contemporary example of this is the commemoration of the Pope whenever the Patriarch of Constantinople did together with him. This yeah. is not only documented, but they have a video of it. Now, it follows that if you truly believe that the Orthodox Church is the church established by Christ, then the Roman Catholic Church is not. However, when they get together in meetings, in these ecumenical meetings, they always commemorate the Pope of Rome first as though he is an Orthodox bishop. If you do that, that indicates that you do not believe that the Orthodox Church is the one true church, but only a part of the one true church. And it's not like people don't know about the heresies of papism. It's been a long time. Yeah, that's kind of been condemned for a few hundred years now. So or, yeah, like, like nine hundred years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nine hundred years, and then re reconfirmed in two panels. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So right. the idea that it's like, oh, but maybe they have changed. No, they haven't. If they if they change, and they become worse every century. It's become yeah. worse. And that's the worst part of this is that ultimately it's um. This is obvious. Uh, that's the worst. I guess that's, I, the worst part of the ecumenical heresy is that, quite frankly, it's it's blatantly in your face about what it is doing, and people are like, "Oh, it's not that bad." Okay, maybe that's Stockholm syndrome, or maybe that's just you're really, really, really personally attached to the priest. Maybe he's your dad. I don't know, but the point is, it's not orthodoxy. And yeah, Father Mark makes a great point that the video photographic evidence of ecumenism alone is enough for deposition. It absolutely is. And they take advantage of the fact that their entrenched hierarchy, which is producing more ecumenists, will never do that for them. They're falling away from the church. I mean, I've yet to see where, I mean, I've yet to see the Melidius of Antioch arise from any of these fighting from within people. Well, that's because they, not, not, they never made well, it the they, they did <laughs> arise. It happened decades ago, and they became too orthodox. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not, uh, yeah, so, a lot of people just got out. Uh, now, now you mentioned the part about Kiprianos and the funding formula. I, I'd like to make a point about that. Years ago, when I was on Facebook, um, there were there were people who like like they started discovering like old, you know old Kiprianite writings, and then they yeah. learned the sin and resistance sort of dissolved and joined uh, the Kalinikites. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Kalinikites. Okay, so yeah. So they, they essentially just disintegrated and just joined them. Okay, and they were like disappointed. They were like, "Well, why didn't they wait longer?" And and, and I said to them, "Look." You know, people like you, I'm not, I wasn't trying to be mean. You were attacking Kiprianos 20 years ago. All right. Uh, I mean, it's now you're just hoping he's right. It's almost, yeah, it's almost like, uh, you know, people, you, you sort of bend over backwards for people uh, who despise you 
and they and they hate you and they say everything they can everything in the book about you mm-hmm. and then when you're gone they're like oh well i wish he was still around but do they really or yeah, it's 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 a it's a two edged sword. I, I don't know if that's the right analogy. Yeah, and I, I think I think uh, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like uh, I think what what is ultimately uh, happening, and we're going to keep seeing this because the, again, there's Father Peter, and then you have the case of Father Theodore Jesus and his group. And I remember you had actually I think sent me a video of one thing where he was like, "We're not going to do it like the old calendarists. We're going to do it right this time." And it never like, turned out. It never turned out. It's it's literally like five or six priests. I think he was calendar. hoping that he he called Sarah from Piraeus the Lion of Orthodoxy, but Sarah from never came to his help. He never came to his aid. Nope. Uh, nope. They're not gonna they're not gonna do anything. Uh, remember, Sarah from Piraeus is busy most of the time condemning the Serbian patriarch for not having valid baptism. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's it, it's it's there's, there's all you know. Uh, that's that's actually an, another issue entirely about that goes back to the, like 18th century. So there's other. You know, but I mean, it, it's, it's almost like Seraphim of Piraeus is like there to say crazy things and to like for people to point. I mean, I'm almost I'm a little conspiratorial. He's, a, he's, a, he's like a pressure release valve. Yeah, they allow maybe, maybe and he probably believes this. They just allow him to there to say, you know, he says enough like anti ecumenical things and he says like something crazy. It's yeah. generally crazy, not just like. Cons- I mean, there's a lot of conspiracies, you know, and, and I, you know, I don't think there's any problem with that. Controlled opposition. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to be, you yourself don't have to know your controlled opposition. That's actually the best topic, controlled opposition. Yeah. I mean, You're like allowed to exist. Fire. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and he never really does anything. He can't, he can't really do anything, even if you wanted to. I, I think there were two new calendar, <laughs> there were two, there was Isaiah and another new calendar bishop in, in uh, Greece who like opposed the vaccine, the, the COVID shot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They they, got I think they deposed them or they arrested them. They, you know, they yeah, actually they put them in were, jail. Yeah. Now, uh, Atomic League wants to follow up on what What's wrong with the? I guess he wants to know what is uh, Seraphim of Piraeus. Uh, well, issue. Seraphim of Piraeus's view is that the Serbian patriarchate hadn't had like canonical baptism since like the 1750s. Um, part of that is it, it is pretty documented. If you, I mean, you, you if they, you look they, at they, um, they, they infused, don't they? They like poor. Um, I mean, it, it's it's at, in Serbia the general. I mean, I'm sure you can find a priest who doesn't do this, but if you can find enough documentary evidence that. You know, since probably the 1750s, maybe under Austrian influence, I'm not quite sure. Um, the Serbs uh, have not uniform have have been like would put the baby in the font and they pour water over the baby. Uh, it would be more like profusion baptism. Uh, in fact, that created such a controversy that um, like the old believers in the 1840s when they were going around to all these uh, um, like Balkan bishops trying to find somebody who would do a, a consecration for them. All right. Um, they like universally rejected the Serbs because they said, "Oh, they're not even really baptized." Wow. Now, I'm not. I'm not saying that because they're obviously old believers. Um, yeah. Um, obviously, you know, the church never broke communion with them um, over the question. You know, over the question, but I, I have to say, it this when you when you have even if you claim, well, we're setting the baby in the font and we're having a bucket of water and pouring over the head three times. The problem is that that gradually degenerates over time. Yeah. Uh, to the point where in the Serbian Patriarch at this point, if you can look, look on YouTube for, for many ba- Serbian baptisms, and they'll just kind of hold the baby, and the priest will, like wet his hand and just like cut water over the hand like three times over pavement, not even in the font. Um, wow. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, I mean, you will find like Greek bi- Greek New Calendar bishops who are sort of more little, at least stint, semi-serious, saying, well, this is like Sarah from Piraeus was saying, like, we don't accept this. Um uh, in, in all the rest. I mean, that's that's sort of an, uh, you know, issue. Now, I knew somebody who knew a Bishop Basil, the, the free serve bishop in New York back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they said that when he did baptisms, that he did always like triple immersion and such like oh, that. So, they, um, so it right. I, it, that, that could be, it could be that some of them like made a point of saying, look, we got to go back to the canonical form and such. But, you know, it's, it's, it's generally acknowledged at this point that um, the Serbian Patriarchate, the form of baptism is basically sort of like somewhere between sprinkling and a f- in a fusion um and uh there, there's the, the evidence is that that goes back that's just not something from the past 70 years that goes back to the to the early 19th century at least probably yeah. to the 18th century but free serbs in general don't do that then, then, i i mean so I, a, I, it could be because they it could be because they were intentionally a reaction to things that they 
you know, maybe that's. I mean, they there aren't there aren't many the, there aren't that many free Serbs that are free from the the patriarchate at this point. They're a small minority, and they're joined various yeah. different groups. Um. So I mean, you know, that's that's uh, you know an issue. I mean, I mean, it, uh, to talk about reception through uh, economy. Remember, we've always talked about the Polotsk Sobor. All right. Uh, in 1839, where they simply accepted all like a thousand union priests and seven union bishops by just a confession of faith, what have you. I mean, in fact, the entire population of Belarus was union in 1839. In 1840, they became Orthodox. They didn't do mass rebaptisms uh, or rechrismations of them as such. Um, you know, but it's worth noting that anyway. it, it's worth noting that they may have actually had the Orthodox swarm um, because of the fact that uh, the sprinkling. Uh, among the unions is something that was considered what's known as a Latinization, so it may have actually. Well, I mean, most uh, most of the papists didn't really do sprinkling. They they did they did a fusion. Sprinkling right. sprinkling wasn't really that heavily practiced because it was considered by the Roman Catholic tech, moral theologian sort of called would say that sprinkling was dubious, but might be possibly they would do it like an emergency, but then they would just do it another baptism, conditional yeah. baptism afterwards, or something like that. Um, the, the problem with the Belarusian question is that Belarusians were some of the most highly Latinized of units uh, until Joseph Shemeshko became their metropolitan. He kind of like pushed back on that in the 1820s. Like, like Belarusian units were so Latinized that like they had new iconostasis in many places. They simply did. They, 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 they had like kind of like they had Baroque, a, they no had Baroque vestments. They, they look like the, you, know, you, know, you know, the Maronites were heavily Latinized with like yeah. Tridentine type vests. They kind of had the same thing. Uh, many of the Belarusian units would simply even did like their uh, did like some did their they would do like a low mass version of St. John Chrysostom. And they, would do it in, and they would even do it in Polish. There was, in fact, this attempt to make them do it in Polish by the Polish because their concept was that the, the Polish uh, Latin bishops wanted to essentially Polonize them. And then they right. just make them go, oh, now you're going to do Latin mass and they give communion one kind. The bishop would come and do chrismations. They had organs, uh, kneelers. They had uh, ro I mean, it, it I can tell you, this, you're gonna, yeah. you may be shocked by this, but there were actually two churches in New York, union churches. One of them, and this this was before I became Orthodox when I saw it, did not have an iconostasis. It only had a ciboria, um, literally just surrounding the altar. That was it. And um, it was a Byzantine Catholic church, and there was actually a Ukrainian Catholic church in Queens. A ciboria, I mean, a ciboria, a sub, what do you mean? A ciboria. ciboria. The, the big, you know, the. the uh, what's oh, the, the Baduchin. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. I see. The Baduchin. And that's all that was there. A ciboria, yeah. Okay. And then there was another one. Uh, this was, was in Queens, and it had a very small iconostasis. And I noticed that they had daily liturgies. I'm not kidding. The priest was literally doing like the kneeling and bowing like they do in uh, like in a Western service and was whispering the entire service. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, that anyway, my point was is that uh, that was sort of like how the units in Belarus were, because I think they were this heavy Polish influence. Uh, yeah, my point in, is, in fact, still even, in fact, when they had, in fact, in the aftermath of the Polot Sobor, there was this whole question because some of these Belarusian parishes that were on the border of the kingdom of the, the king of Poland, which is technically called the Russian Empire, um, no one really knew if they were originally uh, like like uh, pa uh, Latin papal right, Roman right parishes or Byzantine right union parishes. It was just so confusing that they know some of these they had no idea who was who. Well, if you whisper it. You wear broke vestments. It's really hard to tell. Well, the problem is that most of the Belarusians units did that. Exactly, you're right, and that's why it was a problem. So Shemeshko kind of had fought back against that, and then eventually they all became Orthodox and such, and all the rest. And which is which was, and if you look at, and you know, obviously the uh, Seventh Ecumenical Council's first session would have been an example of uh, them using like a, a broad economy and receiving them. But of course, the economy was always presupposed upon them maintaining the correct, or at least. This, the 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 general correction general correction of external forms, right? And and this is something I've noticed with people when they they don't they they sort of say that oh it's all the same outside the church and yeah that's true they're all outside the church, but there are degrees to which you can examine uh, heretics and systematics. Well, yeah. To how, to, for example, if there's some Baptist, no, there's no, you can't use a economy with, with Protestant orders because there's no form. It doesn't even exist, right? Um, it was just be impossible, okay? 
Um, even if a well, Baptist I mean, came to you and said he he was doing the Byzantine liturgy and he, he was doing Byzantine ordination rites and whatever, it, it was still there's no there's no outward form of apostolic succession that simply doesn't exist there. Um, so I mean that that's generally been how the church like that was one of the problems of the scholastic argument. They could make correct arguments about like ex external forms. All right. Uh, their mistake was simply assuming that this automatically is conveying, you know, uh, con the interior kind of, consecrating grace. Yeah. All right. So anyway, um, yeah. Okay, I think we've uh, gone long enough, uh, Father. I think so, and it was great to have everyone here. Um, we haven't really decided on how many, you know, things we're going to do in the future because we're still working with different things, and we're going to do. We're, we'll be back <laughs> soon. Um, hopefully, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been a busy time. Um, it's always you can always reach out to us. Um, if you know us, uh, we're both on Element, we're on Gab. Um, uh, I don't know, are you still on Minds? I mean, I'm on a few, uh, maybe of these, I don't, yeah. I don't really I'm know. on a few of these like pro Trump things like True Social that I never use or Parlor. Uh, so, but mostly on Gab. <laughs> anyway, you know. no, I, now, by the way, um, before we go, uh, someone had asked me yesterday, uh, Saturday, maybe Friday, uh, about a reference in the commentary on the exposition of the Psalms by St. Cassiodorus um, on Psalm 61. St. Cassiodorus oh, yeah. uh, reposed in 585. Uh, he died at the age of 100, by the way. Uh, he was an interesting figure. He wrote a number of works. Anyway... Um, so this uh, person I know asked me, well, it seems to say that he's teaching, you know, uh, obviously like some sort of something that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son in the text, because the standard English translation renders it as that, okay? Uh, of course, the problem, I made a gab post about this, I don't, you know, for what it's worth, uh, would I sort of explain it? Uh, maybe I'm I actually could... putting it up. Okay, you are? Okay. Um... Okay, so uh, so I thought well before I call I called this uh, I called this uh, called him back around I was going to call him back around three o'clock but I said today um, after I got out of church and I said well let me look at the manuscript I, I want to look and see if I can find the earliest manuscript of Saint Cassiodorus's commentary on the Psalms because I'm, I'm just just to make sure so I found that there's a Durham manuscript came uh, carried in Durham University. Um, I don't know if you can make you can just click on the uh, the number. You can make it bigger, so it probably just only has the. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Okay. Just, uh... So I looked it up, and I had opened up the Patrologia Latina version, which is like a clean Latin version. All right, and I had it in two different tabs. And um, so the there's a earliest manuscript, or complete manuscript, or any manuscript, I guess. The Saint Cassiodorus Exposition is from Northumbria. Or copied in Northumbria from the 700s, the King of Northumbria, which is in, which was in uh, is in England. Um, and uh, what I discovered is that after about 20 minutes of searching, because you know how you know you have to go through the manuscript, um, I found Psalm 61 in the manuscript. I found uh, ver the commentary in verse one, and lo and behold. Uh, the Saint Cassiodorus in the in the oldest manuscript says nothing about, you know, uh, you know, sa, set pat something like set. He doesn't say set patre, uh, et filia or et filio procedentum or something. All right. In fact, the the, the, the four verses that the Patrologi records are not even extant. The four last verses of these this, and the four last sentences in Latin are not even there in the oldest manuscripts. All right. So. Oh, well, yeah, that's you know, I, so I told, I told, I said, I said, Boniface, look, you know, this is this is a kind of hermeneutic to follow. First, did a father say this? Two, is it an interpolate? If if is it really is it an interpolation or is it a uh, forgery? Because if that's the case, we don't even need to go down the route of, of looking at it, right? And it turned out this is not genuinely part of Saint Cassiodorus's works. Um, so you know, and I and I say something like. Um, I say, well, it would be erroneous, I think, to simply, you know, basically to say every interpol, every filial reference in the early Latin father in a father is interpolation, um, because I think there the ones are in St. Ambrose are probably one or two are probably genuine. Uh, but I don't think he's teaching what later was taught. Um that um that uh you know there probably are a lot more than people are now are are, are, are comfortable admitting, right? So if we go suddenly from 100 references to, let's say, there's really only 15 or 20 
genuine, yeah. maybe at most ten, maybe ten even references in, in, in the Latin fathers. Well, this is this is a sort of problematic, especially considering the fact that you know a, a massive case was based upon interpolated and forged text. Now, I don't blame the people in the ninth, tenth, twelfth, whatever, eleventh century, who simply thought, well, this this is what it says. All right. Right. Because obviously, if someone says, here's the earliest manuscript of St. Ambrose, here's what he says, um, I'm not going to omit the text if that's what he says. Okay. If I believe that's what he says. Okay. Uh, and because if you start omitting text, even because you think a father misspoke or you don't like the phrase he used, then you're you're participating in something that's not actually that's that's, that's dangerous to uh, to to tamper with. You're, you're, you're doing something in reverse to what these people did. OK, um, so, um, you know, and, and, you know, St. Photius's hermeneutic was essentially that one. OK, is is it actually a lot of people say St. So and so said this. Well, first off, look up the passage. Did he actually say that? Or is that someone's interpretation of what he said? And I find in many cases, St. So and so or I'm not not to didn't not, not to be flippant, like never said what they said he said like i've said yeah. heard people say saint augustine said uh saint augustine said that this is the claim that um matter was evil well no n he never said that or saint augustine said um you know uh human nature ceased to be in the image of god after the fall well, no he never said that saint augustine or they would say saint augustine believed human nature became essentially evil after the fall no, in fact he explicitly declaims that for his entire life what they're trying to say is if you logically follow some line of argument down the road, if A is B, B is C, when you finally get to M, this implies this, all right? And it's a tortured logic, so to speak. So first, do they say it? Secondly, is it a genuine passage of the fathers? Is it, a, is it even a genuine work? If it's a genuine work, is it an interpolation in a genuine work? If you sort of go down those, those two or three points, you find that 90% of your problems evaporate about patristic difficulties all right yep. uh and if you follow the the logic for the third point if if it's genuine uh the after question is what did the father mean did he mean what people later later saying he meant by it why did he write it did he hold that position continuously all right um and only as a last resort like with saint photius and, and and i myself would agree would we say that a saint was mistaken or an error after we've gone through this whole series of events or a series of and, and of, um, of questions about it. Uh, people don't do that. They simply say, even in a genuine passage, where there's, I, I've seen books where they say, well, St. So-and-so, St. Basil said this, or St. Gregory said this, or St. You know, Cassiodorus said this, and therefore that's the truth. Well, it turns out most of the time they didn't even say what they said they said, and if they do find a, a, a manuscript, a lot of times it's just fabricated. All right? Just straight yeah. up made up. Uh, and you know, it's just bad scholarship. I've noticed this continuously. The claim that St. Damasus of Rome taught, no. The claim that St. Gennadius of uh, Marseille taught this, no. Uh, the, the claim that they can, that uh, the, the, the... Yeah, exactly. I mean, even the even the supposed genuine reference in his etymologies has problems with it because uh, you can look in, uh, the, in, the, in the manuscripts and people have noticed this before, not just as Zorner or Zernikoff, where... Uh, the, where it supposedly says he's teaching the filioque, assuming you know whatever he's teaching, if if it's even the later understanding, uh, the way he uses the word eus, all right, when referencing uh, which is a um, you know a, his, it, but in later manuscripts you find them used like in Latin many Latin published editions they'll change it to aorum, because it doesn't make grammatical sense for him to say eus in reference to the to the uh, the Holy Spirit proceeding. All right, because he's proceeding not. Why would he say that he proceeds from the Father and the Son? He he proceed. The Spirit is his. You'd have to look at the text to, to understand what yeah. I'm saying. Um, and, and just like the uh, there's another work of Saint Isidore Seville. They claimed to have the filioque. And if you look in the earliest manuscript in the 700s, it's very clear. You can see in one manuscript someone wrote at Patri filioque over the text, and then the next scribe who copied it, they actually wrote ex Patri ex Patri filioque. Wow. Which doesn't make any. In other words, they just the next scribe just because a lot of scribes, they're not. You're not saying ninety. I'm not saying ninety nine percent of scribes were intentionally corrupting things. They're just saying, well, someone wrote this over the line. Maybe this is actually part of the text. I'm just sort of almost like in a robotic sense, people just copy things. Yeah. All right. So if you mess up, if somebody 
puts even like an, a marginal note over something uh, that can be copied 10 years later by a scribe just thinking that's originally part of the text. All right. And that happens a lot. Uh, and, and that and that creates problems. It, it, it doesn't mean 90 is there was one person who claimed I was trying to say the entire Latin patristic or even the Greek patristic textual tradition was corrupt. I'm not, I never said that. I'm saying you can have 99.99 percent of the text be authentic. And I think that's accurate. OK, but a point zero zero one percent you're talking about the word just the compound word filioque or et filio and that can have profound effects down the road like you know in the book of revelation at the very end of it um uh the, i think the angel says to saint you know says curse is anyone who adds or takes away from the prophecies of this book all right, right. Uh, and i think we can extend that to say that you know that's a principle if you start adding not just the scriptures if you start adding and taking away things uh, whatever for whatever reason um, to the fathers, you're going to have profound effects down the road. All right. Mm -hmm. Even if they Absolutely. had, even if they didn't necessarily, I mean, I, I think I'd, something else was going on when people were adding these stuff here in the marginal notes, but you're going to cause all kinds of damage. All right. And you're going to get to the point where you have like 13th century in the 1200s in England, like, uh, like John Peckham, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury. I mean, his quad libet text He'll say things like, well, you know, the filioque isn't logically necessary and the, it's not even necessary from the patristic texts. But because, the, you know, uh, but because the Council of Lyons in 12, whatever, 1200s it decided it was so, I have to accept it, even though I don't think it's necessary to accept it. All right. And then there was these, I mean, or Thomas Aquinas. I mean, I mean, that's actually a sad case where you had people like Robert Grossetest or even Tom, John Peckham. I think actually probably realized there were real problems with it. All right. Um, they were educated enough to know that, but they were almost trapped in this system where, well, you know, you know, I guess they, they claim there was an ecumenical council claiming it. And, you know, you had Aquinas writing his uh, erroneous text, you know, against the errors of the Greeks, which is just 90% or 80% made up of interpolations. Uh, and people just said, well, I, you know, they were claiming St. Athanasius taught the Filioque, all right? They, you're just claiming St. Basil taught it, just forged material. If that's what you have, then I guess you're going to go down that route, and it's going to lead uh, to wild deformations and major problems. So so that's why don't mess with text. Don't mess with uh, the, the textual tradition. Um, and it's important to actually have critical editions. Great. I was going to say that there's really provided value, and we really need more of them in the patristic space. Yeah. Um, they, they will help a lot. Well, I was going to, I was looking up actually the CC, the CCSL, um, which publishes critical text. Uh, but a lot of the, like I was going to, I was looking up the version for the exposition of the Psalms of St. Cassie Doris and the two volumes of it. And they're like 180, $200 a volume. And I'm, I'm simply not going to buy, buy that. Wow. Um, and, uh, if they had it for a free PDF, I'd look at it. If it was even $20, I'd, I'd probably buy it. But, you know, I don't want I have I, I because I have bought and that's the other point. I have in some cases bought critical texts. All right. That were like twenty dollars or so. And in some of those cases, I have done manuscript research independent. I can't quite remember the case of it where I've shown that the critical texts actually weren't as good as independent research. Wow. So even even there, you have to be careful and you need to actually do. You're going to have to do a little bit independent research because, look, you're having people like Siasinski. Who you know may be a genuine man, but he's an ecumenist, publishing books about the filioque, claiming like Damasus and Gennadius taught the filioque, an exploded idea. A. E. Burns uh, showed that how erroneous that was in 1890. You can look at the even the modern critical editions of Gennadius, and you can see that's not the case. All right. Wow. Um, I remember Basil Polivka that I used to interact with on um, uh, Facebook years ago. Uh, you know, on his first try, he looked at he looked at uh, one of the uh, the Egerton manuscripts of the uh, Dialogues of Saint Gregory the Great from 10th century England, and you could tell right there, you know, at the very last chapter, uh, um, the second, not the, what the chapter 37 or 38 of, of dialogue of the second book of dialogues that's often quoted to support the filioque, you can see the text doesn't have it. In fact, somebody wrote it over the over the text, right in wow. the margin. All right, by a later hand, probably 11th century or something like that. All right. Um, but if you look in a lot of these, um, you know, standard editions, they'll just say, oh, no, he taught it or something like that. Right. Um, it, it's and, just assumed. And there's so much 
um, in modern academia, especially in ecclesiastical circles, that is well, just look, look, here. If if it was shown that eighty percent or ninety percent of Filioque references in Latin fathers were interpolations, and only ten percent were genuine, uh, that would be devastating. Yeah. All right. Now it would be devastating. Now today, I mean. I don't think it would be devastating to the ecumenists because they probably don't care that they've moved beyond even caring about those things. I think it would be devastating to people who are actually concerned about these issues. Yeah, right? like more traditional Roman Catholic. Unfortunately, however, there are others who claim to not to be ecumenists who would say things like, who cares about the filioque? Way? There are these abstract arguments about um, how the West or the East differed from the fourth century. And, right, that's when it know, devolves right back into scholasticism and bad history. Yes. Like uh, there's this uh, fellow called David Bradshaw who says, uh, you know, oh, well, why were they even talking about the filioque and unleavened bread? That didn't really matter. It was really this argument about but uh, did they accept Cappadocian fathers or understand them correctly or they didn't. And that's these other issues had no had no real impact. Um, and it's, it's sort of frustrating to, to to see people say that. Now, he may, you know, have his own views about that. They're probably wrong. Uh, but, you know. Again, I've, I've encountered these these individuals where you can say, look, you know, these are interpolations. Uh, I mean, even now they're sort of admitting that at the very earliest, the filioque didn't show up in the in the Spanish church until at least 653, which has been a major change. Now, that that's a, that's a major admission. I think it's much later, but you can see how they're slowly moving the goalposts. Yeah, I mean, in, but but the problem is this: by the time they are they're going to fully admit all this, I mean, I, I suspect you have German scholars who have obscure. I've said this before: obscure textbooks about these issues, and they'll say, "Yeah, these are all like interpolated." There's like only ten percent are actually genuine, and at this point, nobody cares. I mean, we care, yeah. um, but most of those people they don't believe really in any religious questions anymore. Uh, um, I mean, like, I remember people saying, well, you know, Archbishop Kelfrith of Canterbury said he believed, well, well, did he really? I mean, you look at Dr. Richter's book on the Canterbury professions, and he straight up says these are all copied from the um, Canterbury, Canterbury the, the, the profession of Kelfrith is not even an original. It's from the, like, the late 12th century. All right. right. And he says there are evident, there are, there's evidence of tampering with the text. Now, we have a lot of material from before the conquest that's not tampered with. I mean, so we can, we can look at it. All right. But when you start looking at supposedly what St. Kelfrith from 815 said, but it's only in found in one manuscript from like 1180, um, and the scholars admit, you know, somebody, you know, and it's, you know, the Rufensis Textus, and that was even copied, and they're really talking about a text that's not from the 12th century, but from the 13th century, but they're claiming it's copied from the 12th century. Um, and you're trying to base your whole dot, your whole point on that. I mean, you're, you're running into a lot of problems, all right? Um so that's why always going back to primary sources is is is, is very important. You know, and, and, and by the way, it's not it's not yeah. destroying the it's not destroying any patristic. It's actually establishing the patristic tradition even better. Correct. Um, because otherwise, you're just going to let you know, uh, um, lot, frankly, lies pass for what the father said. And that's not it. That's that's uh, and, and in and of itself, the kind of the the duty of clearing up uh, uh, slanders or libels against the fathers is uh i think a good work for any christian to do so all right well um i think that should wrap it up we're at just over two hours and i'd like to thank everyone for listening everyone who commented everyone who was here um for being here and um we'll be back soon and uh you know uh, have a productive uh, great lunch uh, everyone right. okay and then you should do. Then you should do.